Francisca Jostiet is the creative mastermind and perfumer behind the luxury perfume brand Louisa Jo Wild Perfumery. After more than 12 years in the fragrance industry, where she served in various roles at International Flavors and Fragrances, or IFF, Francisca founded her own luxury fragrance house, and it is here to change the paradigm of perfume, from smelling like a brand to the beautiful reality that you are the secret ingredient to your signature scent. Her fragrances bring to life your own unique scent that will make everyone in your sphere wonder why you smell so gorgeous. I absolutely love the ethos of Louisa Jo and everything Francisca is bringing into the world. For anyone who is new to a place or simply trying to reinvent themselves, fragrance is a very subtle yet powerful way to start again in a new era of your life story. I love Louisa Jo so much that Francisca and I are going to host an event together in November. It will be an evening to indulge your senses and learn more about the art of fragrance. Francisca will take us through different ways smell touches our lives and how we feel and people treat us. Think of it like a wine tasting, but for scents. It will be an, an exclusive experience as we only have 15 spots available. For tickets and more information, check the show notes or go to houseofperegrine.com slash events to sign up. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Francisca. If you do, feel free to share it with a friend. This is the best way to get the word out and support House of Peregrine and our mission to connect people living internationally more deeply with each other, the place they currently call home, and themselves. If you are finding this podcast useful, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube under House of Peregrine. That is a zero-cost way to support us. In addition, please subscribe to the podcast on Spotify and Apple. And on both Spotify and Apple, you can leave us up to a five-star review. If you have questions for me or comments about the podcast or topics or guests you'd like me to consider for our podcast, please put those in the comment section on Spotify or Apple or DM us on socials. I read every single comment. If you are not yet following us on social media, we are House of Peregrine on all social media platforms. That's Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And in all of those channels, we discuss living abroad and ways to find a deeper connection with yourself those around you, and the place you currently call home. If you would like to know more about memberships or our events, please find out more at houseofperegrine.com. Okay, on to today's show. Hello, Francisca, and thank you so much for joining us today on the House of Peregrine podcast. I am really, really excited to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I want to start out by letting people know what your story is, how, where you grew up, and maybe part of your life as an international person. Yes, so uh, I'm German, first of all. Uh, I grew up in Western Germany, and I yeah studied uh, business studies in Paris, in London, and in Amsterdam. That was quite a coincidence, to be honest. That was not planned up front but uh, that's yeah life took me there somehow and uh, I studied business studies and finance which um, yeah was quite boring to be honest but um, that's why I chose to live in beautiful exciting cities in order to compensate basically <laughs> yeah. it's, all the best stories start with both um, I had it was an accident and I chose to live <laughs> oh, funny yeah same yeah. for you <laughs> um, but yeah so you chose to so you have you went to school and got degree or degrees in finance that was kind of your background yeah indeed um, the first two years in Paris were quite finance driven um, the last year of my bachelor was more like an entrepreneurial um, course I took and the last year, my master was more a generic business studies that I've done. Yeah. And so were you studying, you were studying abroad most of that time. You grew up in Germany. What, what inspired you to move away from where you grew up? Um, well, most of my friends stayed in Germany. Um, I was always inspired by the language French. I really liked it. But I didn't want to become a teacher. That was my mom's recommendation, but I, I didn't see me there. So my idea was a bit like, okay, maybe I can combine uh, what I really like and what maybe will, yeah, will serve me later. And that was the business study, the boring business study. Um, but I thought 
I don't, I cannot decide yet really where my passion is. It needs a bit more time. So I just decided to go for the safe option, but then in a vibrant city and having French at the same time. So I really, I studied in French. Um, so you were so, following your passion for French, basically. Indeed, that was the initial idea. And kind of leave it open to whatever happens so that I have a good background, a, a good foundation to whatever comes on my on my journey afterwards. Being open and being getting to know other people, that was my idea mostly like in Paris to open up my horizon, basically, yeah. Nice. And when did you know that? When did you, I find that, people like you and I, there's a, there's a moment or a knowing that maybe you want to go away or want to experience something different than maybe the people around you. Do you remember, do you have a moment like that or was it always something you just knew? Yeah. Um, with my parents, I never really traveled a lot. Uh, they didn't do exciting trips. It was always nice, but we always, uh, we stayed in Europe and okay. So that was fine, but it was not very inspiring in that sense. I didn't grow up with that. But um, I think I also wanted a bit of uh, more excitement. I also, I was really curious kind of to get to know people that I don't know yet. And uh, a bit the unknown. I wanted to explore the unknown and jump into new be living on my own also with other people. We, uh, I, in the end, ended up in a nice, um, really beautiful apartment with three other, we, we were three girls. Um, I didn't know them before, but it was an old uh, Moulin Rouge apartment. Um, so it was also full of history and very exciting. And the other girls, women, they worked, both of them, in fashion. And so they were also very inspiring to me. Um, we had a lot of party and um, it was, yeah, really enjoyable years. And that compensated really for the finance um, studies, basically. <laughs> so you got to bring in creativity one way or another. Um, and of course, there's creativity in finance for some people. But for you, that's not what was inspiring you. No. Yeah, cool. Indeed. Yeah. So when did you, so you're in Paris in this Moulin Rouge setting i can imagine mm -hmm. you there mm -hmm. um what happens next i um finished my french degree which was not well known in germany um germany for my last year of bachelor they did really difficult in terms of uh moving back to germany i asked once a university but um, in terms of paperwork administrative work it's quite bureaucratic um, so I just sent a message to a public university in London and they directly let me into their third year of bachelor. So then my decision was clear. I'm going to London, which was, yeah, also not planned up front, but it really came. Um, and um, so I had one year in London. That was also very nice. Um, I was also living in a, in a house full of uh, other people. We were seven people all different, not just studying, but also people from all different countries and um, just doing other things. That was a really nice year. And afterwards, I decided to move to Amsterdam for my master degree. Because in Germany, again, it was two years. And in Amsterdam, it was in English and one year. So that was clear for me that I needed to go to Amsterdam. Um, yeah, so it was always a spontaneous decision. Um, but it, it it really was felt like a good one, yeah. a safe one. It sounds like you followed your, you're following your language, what, you're guided by language, and then you're just being open to what comes. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, I, I love to experience new, experience new things and I'm not afraid to, yeah, be, stepping out of the comfort zone. Let's put it like this, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it's a value for you almost. Yeah, indeed, it is. It is uh, like, yeah, I'm also trying to teach my my kids the same, like uh, really the when they find something exciting and they're totally, um, yeah, like, totally nervous. I'm like, this is the growth moment. This is where you take most advantage from, take it, uh, embrace it kind of. Yeah, 
let's see if that works out with them as well. But uh, yeah. for me, it did. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about this. So I think that um, there's two kinds of ways you can take a feeling of being scared, would you mm -hmm. say? And so you're saying, embrace it, use it, bottle it. That's a yes. <laughs> um, yeah. If you're scared, that that that's your yes, not yeah. a no. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that a good way of putting it? Indeed. Yeah. yeah. I really feel like exactly those moments where you feel, oh, this is really kind of painful or this is out of the comfort zone. Yeah. This is where the growth pain is, is coming in and uh, where you learn most about yourself, about like um, afterwards looking back when you stepped out of the situation where you think like, okay, well done or, or not well done, but then next time I know now what to do. So no matter yeah. the outcome, it's, it serves you in the end, yeah. Yeah. Um, where do you think you learned that? Yeah, that's a good question. I know my father used to kind of push boundaries a lot. Um, I think I got it from him. Well, first of all, I think my both parents did a great job in terms of giving me a good foundation of because I think leaving the comfort zone means that you have a strong comfort zone. Um, then you are much more, then you can much more easily leave that comfort zone. But also, I remember my dad uh, really like being little in a in a swimming pool, and I remember there was the three meter where you can jump from, you know, the three meter stepping. Or I don't know how do you call it, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was nerve wracking for me. I was so excited, but my dad was like, "Just do it." and yeah, there will there's water, so nothing can happen. And he even tried to convince me to jump head first. Um, and he, yeah, he really supported me and always kind of pushed the boundaries. And I also remember that um, my dad's friend was a hunter, for instance. He got rabbits um, that he was hunting. He gave them to us, dead rabbits. And I remember me and my dad being in the garden hanging the rabbit on the on the tree and we just took the skin off and when i think back i a lot of kids i guess would say like oh my disgusting and blah but i remember when your dad doesn't say uh, that something is maybe disgusting if you don't have even the idea put in your mind it was totally normal and it was totally okay and beautiful and um, so I think as a kid, you're quickly influenced. And if somebody guides you into the direction of let's just look for the boundaries, whatever it, within your capabilities, what you can do, that brings you quite far. Yeah. My dad, my dad growing up was a butcher. So I get oh, it. <laughs> funny, funny, indeed. Yeah. You definitely grow up with a different perspective if you have that experience. Yeah. Um, and it is a creative and kind of, in a way sac sacred process of, of taking that animal and then taking it all the way through um, to a meal. Um, so Indeed. I really love, I, I love that I have that experience now. And as a kid, I didn't know it was strange. Yeah. That, or if you're strange for today. <laughs> yeah. 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 Indeed. And now I know it's a totally different period we're living in, but my kids like heard from somebody else that it's terrible to eat f a meat. And then I'm like, yeah, but is it, yeah, yeah, is it terrible to eat only the one part of the, of the chicken, uh, only the breast, you know, and uh, why not then when you eat it, eat the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I try to teach them to be a bit reasonable and to think about the entire process. Yeah. Yeah. Be holistic about it. Indeed. Um, yeah. yeah. That makes total sense. Um, I, I didn't expect to talk about uh, meat. No. Today, but that's <laughs> I'm glad we did. Um, but so I think, so what, where did the French, the love for French come from? Um, I thought about it as well once because um, my, my mother is good in languages, first oh. of all. She was always, I don't know, also reading books in French and English, even though she kind of never left Europe or Germany. Uh, but she's just, she's talented. But also I think... Um, the teacher make a huge, I remember my first English teacher, she was a fat, frustrated old lady. She was not a nice person. And she, she was also not having fun in her job. 
she was just frustrated and I don't have a good impression of my first years of English teaching and then I remember my first French teacher was a very lovely person where I always as a young girl already thought like one day I would love to have a glass of wine with him in front of a chimney <laughs> not in a romantic way but just as like he was he was a nice kind person and he was inspiring and I think that made a huge difference plus the sound I like I like the sound yeah, yeah it feels good in your in your mouth and your body yeah I, what something to aspire to is I want to have a glass of wine with them in front of a fire that's my new goal in life is to be that person yeah <laughs> good <laughs> Thanks for giving me a new goal. Yeah. Um, well, that is very interesting. Okay. So then you're in Amsterdam. What happens in Amsterdam? I then have to go a bit back because in Amsterdam, I did my master degrees. That meant that I afterwards need to decide the moment where you need to decide what you want to do with your life. But a few years back when I was in Paris still, I um, was on a train to uh, go back to Germany for a weekend. I, and I, met a person next to me, a woman, and she, we got into a conversation, which is always nice on the train, and she told me about uh, um, where she works in a huge fragrance house, perfume house. So I was like, oh, I didn't even know. A new world opened up, kind of, their fragrance houses. I didn't know. Yeah, tell us what that, that means. <laughs> yeah, indeed. I, I didn't know myself back then. Um, so basically, she told me that all the perfumes that are out there in Douglas, Easy Paris, and Sephora, they are not done by Sephora or not done by L'Oréal and Coty and Estée Lauder, but they are done by how perfume big corporates that only specialize on perfumes, mm -hmm. on perfume oils, basically. And um, yeah. For me, a new world opened up in the sense that I knew, okay, this is probably, once I'm done, the way I want to go. I would love to learn about this industry and to really deep dive into not just working in a Sephora and selling something that I have no clue about, but really to deep dive into the product itself. Nice. So you just knew somehow that this was a, a place you wanted to spend your time and creativity and your skills. Suddenly this perfume world uh, in process and everything opened up to you in that moment on the train. I love that. Yeah. yeah, indeed. I suddenly had a plan in mind, like for afterwards, once I'm done, um, that was, was really nice because I really had no clue before what I'm doing the study for. Yeah. But then suddenly it gave me a meaning. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So a moment on a train changed everything. Indeed, the woman doesn't know about it. I have no clue. <laughs> I didn't kept her name or something. But uh, yes, it did. Yeah. There's these. I love these moments that change everything. Okay, yeah. so when you graduated, you knew you wanted to work in a perfume house. Do I have that right? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So tell us, tell us what happened next. Yes, I was done uh, with my studies, and I decided to. That was planned before um, to go on a five weeks trip into South um, Africa, uh, South America. Um, so I went to uh, Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Colombia, uh, Miami also on the way back. Five weeks, I've never done a big trip like this. But before that, so there was one day in between, I think, really graduation and then leaving to this five weeks holiday. And one day I still had and I was like, okay, I I know how frustrating it is for my surroundings to apply and to look for a job. But I thought, okay, I have a top three in my mind of companies where I would love to work, the, the perfume houses. I would send them my CV and a nice letter. Who knows uh, what happens? Um, then I, I'm not home, sitting home, waiting for the reply, you know. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did. And I think a week later, when I had no internet, no connection, I got a reply that IFF, International Flavors and Fragrances, they have a huge um, office in Hilversum, close to Amsterdam. And uh, they would like to have me for an interview. I was like, oh, this is beautiful. <laughs> this is, was much quicker than I thought. In the end, they hired me in Germany because I was German. They were desperately looking for somebody to cover um, maternity leave in Germany. 
And uh, so I, yeah, I moved to Hamburg after my um, my trip <clears throat> to start my first job in the sales and marketing department, which was a good fit, I guess, back then with my studies. I had no cl clue about perfumery yet, so it's a good starting was a good starting position for me yeah. to to know get to know the industry. Yeah. yeah, and you continued that for how many years? You stayed in the more corporate perfume tell us tell us that world give us a an impression of how that how the world works what goes into it the creative process yes i remember so i worked in a small office let's say um sales office with like 14 people very beautiful all glass um all design furniture and middle in the center of the city so that was always very you could smell that the margins were good. <laughs> um, and uh, well, but what I also had to learn during those, I stayed for two and a half years in that small setting, was that there's a huge corporate behind. So those 14 people were a little piece of the puzzle, basically, because in total, the company has its headquarters in New York. And um, yeah, all around the world, there are offices um, and the little ones are the sales and marketing offices, but the creative offices where really the perfumes are created, where the research is done, um, those offices are really in the, in the big cities in the world. And then they have like six, 700 employees there. Wow. So uh, it's, it's indeed. So what I was... I learned a lot about all those, like, it's a bit like a network, uh, which you first of all have to understand, like a spin web uh, almost, like who is my end customer? It's a huge business to business world. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, strains that you have to understand, first of all, when you're new into into this. And these these people, this web creates the sense of our world, like the sense Scent actually changes or follows us uh, throughout our day, if you if you really think about it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that process and how it changes cross culturally. I think um, what smells clean in Germany might not smell clean in Ger in uh, the U.S. Maybe. Yeah, indeed, that was also one of my learning process. Um, so yeah, it's a good valid point. So first of all, you have to imagine that I also got to know that IFF, the company I'm using already, now knowing every day, like I guess 20 products of of, of their every household. You have to imagine, so it's international flavors and fragrances. So half the company is busy with flavors, all the things aroma. So from your bouillon, chicken bouillon, to ice cream, to uh, chips, everything that is, has a flavor to it, um, yogurt, whatever, dairy products. So the whole fridge is full of IFF, basically, or competition. Um, and then also uh, fragrance. So the fragrance business is also really not just fine fragrance, so perfumes, what you see in Essie Paris, but it's also from shampoo, body lotion, candles, um, but also all-purpose cleaner, toilet wind blocks, you know, everything that, that has a smell to it, which people don't think about it. Um, but uh, it, yeah, it is very important because, yeah, like you said, there are studies, for instance, that show um, you can have a detergent. I was, um, I will tell you later, but I became an expert in detergent and fine um, fabrics. So everything that has to do with washing la laundry, fabric mm. softener as well. And uh, there's a huge study done which shows that if you use um, detergent without a smell and with a smell, people perceive the one with a smell as cleaner, cleaning better as the one without a smell, even though, of course, as you can imagine, the smell doesn't contribute to the cleanliness yeah. of the getting the dirt really out of your... But people perceive it as much cleaner. So um, the smell then has a big contribution part. And what you said, interesting enough, cultures are very deeply rooted when it comes to perfumes. 
and that was my second job within the big corporate um, business. Um, I moved after two and a half years into consumer insights because I was interested in indeed what you said. Also, I wanted to get out of this small 14 men office uh, and only being kind of the end person who sells something that was created before I wanted to get really closer to the creation part mm. and learning much more about the product itself. So I needed to move into one of the creative centers, the bigger centers with six, 700 people. So I moved to Hilversum, back to Amsterdam, basically for me and uh, started in the consumer insights department, which is quite analytical, but my business and finance background did help. And in this department, I learned a lot about like if uh, one of the big players, like let's say Unilever wants to launch a blue fabric softener, a new one, that you can often not have the same smell in Italy like you would have in France or in Germany. They really have totally different requirements because smell is so culturally rooted. Hmm. How interesting. And so... When, you're, when you were thinking about creating these products, were you conjuring memories of childhood? Were you bringing in um, scents from the earth? Like, how would you reference what culturally would be appealing to each region or country? Yeah, there are big studies done. You also, I needed to visit a lot of consumers in their home settings. So I smelled, for instance, a lot of washing machines in Italy and France and stuff, um, which was so interesting. I just want to make sure. So you would just like go into someone's house and smell their washing machine. Yes. And so you're using, you're using, this is the creative process of creating and, and integrating a smell. I love this. So this was part of your work, smelling people's washing machines. Yeah, machine. because indeed. Yeah, because you have to imagine we, we created a detergent which we thought in the Netherlands where it smells really clean there's not, it smells very commercial let's say I don't think that anybody can say it doesn't and then we send it off to consumers you get the results back and you suddenly hear it smells moldy it smells uh, earthy it smells disgusting and you're like what happened you know to my detergent yeah. and then you have to go and investigate like uh are those washing machines dirty themselves? What is the water quality like? Because in the UK, for instance, the water itself smells very different than the water in Germany, for instance. It's much more moldy. Um, it has a really different smell to it already. So wow. that also influences the outcome. Yeah. In uh, in Turkey, for instance, a lot of people still smoke at home. So uh, we got a lot of comments like that it smells smoky and we were like, smoky? But then we figured out, yeah, they often let it dry in their living room. Oh. And then they it smoke a lot. It. Yeah. So it becomes yeah. part of the melody yeah. of the smell. And so you're looking at the ingredients going, there is no smoke in what we created. But when it's in, in, in the environment, it takes on a life of its own. And so you had to, to account for that in a way. That is really, really interesting. And I, I can imagine it was a really fun work. Like it seems really creative. Yeah, indeed. You have to um, yeah, work together with the perfumers because you have to tell them uh, the results, what the consumer actually think about their perfumes, uh, which is quite uh, shocking sometimes for them. So you have to deliver the message and also to guide them afterwards. Okay, we need to make the adaptive perfume uh, in that direction more, in that direction more. Uh, for this country, we need more, I don't know, flowery notes. In that country, we need more fresh citrusy notes. So I really... I had to understand a lot of the cultural backgrounds in order to adapt every fragrance to the cultural conditions of the country. And yeah, indeed, that was, was a very exciting, exciting job. Also, we did a lot of focus groups with women, got to, yeah, getting to know what a job well done means for them, being a housewife, how important it is to have a blooming fragrance in the house because then the neighbors or the husband comments on how beautiful the house smells, how well the job is done. And um, so that is quite, you, before I just thought I'm using a detergent and that's it. 
but for a lot of people it really means uh was influencing their confidence and their identity almost identity indeed yeah yeah my kids, when we visit my sister, she uses the same laundry detergent. And so when we come back, they'll say, this smells like Leslie's house. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and that uh, that opened my eyes a lot to this comfort. And I'm really sensitive when it comes to smells. So I usually use unscented as much as I can. Mm-hmm. Um, but she's the opposite. She's one of these people that really... Sensica. Yeah, yeah. Like she's a three-dimensional, her house is a three-dimensional experience or a five-dimensional experience. And so I can imagine that this is almost like a signature scent of your home and your the people that you're taking care of. So that's a really beautiful notion that you got to create for, which is often unseen and unappreciated. Like I, I would have never thought that that much thought went into it. So that's really beautiful. Yeah, it's a big industry indeed. Yeah, I never knew about it either. <laughs> yeah. And so you spent time doing that and then then... What happened? Yeah. Um, so I I got the task that I had to look for the Christmas gifts of my uh, customers, the customers that we, so we always have to give them, of course, at the end of the year. And I could choose the fine fragrances that were kind of the most trendy ones um, that, that, to send to them. So I also asked my boyfriend back home, back then, sorry, uh, he was working in a, in a bank, um, very mm, testosterone-driven environment, let's put it like this. And uh, I asked him what I get everything for free. What would you like to have as a perfume? Because he didn't use any perfume himself. So um, he got back to me saying, I really don't want any of this. And I was like, why not? Um, we even have, I don't know, you know, the nicest brands, Tom Ford and Lancome, whatever you want. Um, but he basically said... Uh, when I put it down on me, on my skin in the morning, when I just come out of the shower with an empty stomach, I find it always far too dramatic and far too loud. And this huge perfume cloud, it's almost sickening for me. And then I go to public transport in Amsterdam. And then in the morning you have, you can almost not, that's an invasion of perfumes here and there. You have another cloud and you can, oh, you can close your eyes, but your nose, it's difficult. So he... This is my life. I'm always like, how can we not scream in public, but we can wear perfume very loudly? Um, and so I, yeah. I identify with this very much of, it, it is an, a bit of an invasion. And, and yeah. some would say it's an expression, which I also agree with. But if you're sensitive to it, it really can change your disturbed. day. Disturbed. Yeah. yeah, it's disturbing for him. Indeed, he found it far too loud. And then he also says, in my environment, in the men's environment, in the bank, that nobody wears a perfume. It's not seen as manly. Mm. So I was oh, can, like, I tell okay. you, can I ask you a quick difference? Yeah. So when where I'm from, or at least where I always think of men's perfume as cologne and women's perfume as perfume. So is, mm-hmm. that, a, is that something that you identify with as well? Um, colognes are basically lower in dosaging. Oh. Colognes, um, they often, so the typical cologne has also a, a typical perfume structure, let's say. It has a lot of uh, Neroli, Petit Grain, so all the fresh notes of, uh, of a cologne, but it also is lower dosed. So mm. I remember my grandmother wa- was wearing cologne all the time. Mm. You smell it at the beginning, but then it's also quickly gone. Mm. Yeah. So that's that's the difference. It's not gendered, actually. No, cologne can also be used for women, indeed. Oh, can yeah. also. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Okay. It's a unisex. It's, cologne means um, that it doesn't last as long. It's far less in dosage than a perfume. Uh, that also means that it is, per um, definition, a bit more manly, indeed, because in the past, it changes now a bit, but in the past, uh, men did not wear too much perfume. It's in the few years that it got more popular, but traditionally it was first a female product and men yeah, came with the years um, more and more into it, but uh, not so strong. Oh, interesting. The percentages for men perfume are always lower than for women perfumes. I see. So it's more like you want to have it for a moment instead of for the whole day. Yeah. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. Less intense. Yeah. Also energy-wise, maybe it's more direct and more round I see it as more straight and more round okay, okay. Good. 
Yeah, interesting. Okay, thanks for letting me ask all my questions. All yeah, my no, questions. good. good. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so yeah. then you're getting this. And so, you have, yeah, what is the next thing that happens? Indeed, yeah. So my boyfriend uh, said basically, no, he doesn't want to have it. And then he also said in the evening when I go for dinner with a client, I would actually like to have a perfume, but not the invasion again. I don't want to also, as a man, you don't take it with you. And I don't want to reapply because then the dramatic cloud is there again. I don't appreciate this. Yeah. Um, but it's also a shame because in the evening, it's everything is gone. Everything that was there in the, the cloud, yeah, it's an evaporation. So that's also gone, of course. What is evaporated is, is uh, gone. So I decided, okay, I can totally understand your point. And that's true. I didn't didn't find that on the market. We didn't have that uh, product that he had in mind. So I created something for him on an oil base. So I put it not in alcohol, which creates the cloud, the evaporation, um, but in an, in a uh, base, which is in coconut oil, basically, that doesn't smell without smell. But so it's a nice, beautiful oil for the skin. Um, that And then I used ingredients that are really more woody and not so invading, more... Uh, pheromones also I put, which is basically the attraction uh, hormones, natural ones from animals I used because I was really intrigued by them myself uh, about the smell. So my intention was much, much more to create not just another perfume, but a skin scent enhancer, mm. something that is not perceived as a perfume also, but really much rather you smell nice not your perfume smells nice so um so i you, you smell nice and because it's amplifying your own like body's scent is that indeed is that right yeah. Okay. yeah yeah that was my intention so i mixed something for him because i back then uh yeah that's important maybe to say so i moved from consumer inside department into the scent design mm. i became a scent design manager at iff uh, which meant that I, first of all, had to pass a huge test if my nose is good enough uh, for the position. Mm. Because now you that meant that I was trained every day uh, for perfume weed, for, for the creative side. But it also means, yeah, you can be trained. If you don't have the good nose, um, then the training will not help. So um, I passed that test. It was great. I could go into the creative side of the business. But that also indeed meant I had a lot of training, sitting together with the perfumers every day, through, smelling through all the ingredients palais, uh, that they have. And uh, yeah, I wrote down so much information, so many nice ingredients that I mixed the, my own perfume, my own, not perfume, but my own scent basically for my boyfriend at home. Gave it to him and he came back the first day. He was oh, going out for lunch with his colleagues. And there was a woman going 10 times up and down. And everybody thought she's crazy. Oh, she lost something. But then she said, no, it's you. She she stopped and said, it's you. And he, my boyfriend was like, what, what is happening with me? And she was like, uh, you smell so gorgeous. And what is it? What, what are you wearing? Yeah. And from then, um, a whole, yeah, his colleagues started to come in. They also wanted to have it. It was the snowball system. He was mm -hmm. more in the morning on the bike. He, um, he got stopped uh, by somebody saying like, oh, so, such a shame that you're going left. Uh, I'm, I need to go straight. It was so lovely to bike behind you. <laughs> <laughs> and those, powerful stuff. Yeah, indeed. So quite uh, some interesting stories that came back to me. And then I uh, mixed it a few times more often and gave it always away for free for, for friends and family. And my dad was wearing it uh, and he got a lot of comments also from other people. Um, and yeah, I, I have kind of collected feedback from those years when I just gave it away. That is very well valuable for me now. That it was kind of... a yeah, product testing without me really noticing. It was a smooth process, not intended, but uh, yeah, somehow it grew out of this just testing at home idea. Yeah. Nice. And so from there, 
we you where are you now now you have this beautiful company and brand indeed so um i just moved into the scent design management role which was a lot of fun and i learned again a tremendous amount of new information and um, network and everything that was great at the same time i started my own experimentations at home um and yeah more and more i got the feedback from other people from my own perfume i could also smell colleagues that were wearing my perfume i could really smell where they went kind of in the building i could follow them I was like, ah, Andrea used to be here, I guess. And indeed, I asked her later, she was here. Um, and then I heard also things like, uh, yeah, it's, it's really like this CEO smell here in the building because the, the managers loved, uh, loved it as well because it's a very classy, classy perfume in a way. So um, the title was also, yeah, really fun for me. And somehow I, the, the idea grow in my mind that it's something that I need to explore maybe later in life. But so I stayed for still quite some years in the corporate job. But there was no need to jump because the corporate was paying well, nice colleagues and exciting job still mm -hmm. to discover. But also... I had two kids in the meantime also, so that was also something where I decided to stay in the corporate setting, security, and yeah, being being in a so safe safe environment. And afterwards, there was COVID coming, of course, <laughs> where I was also like, ah, I'm also staying <laughs> for another year. So in the end, indeed, it was more than 12 years that I stayed which I don't regret. It was a great learning, uh, super nice experience. But then I went to dinner with my boyfriend and I said to him that I think I need to one day jump because I cannot handle like a full-time job plus two kids and do everything good, being a nice wife as well and being myself and all those priorities and starting my own company with a yeah and the time investment that is tremendous it was not possible so i needed to decide and i said to myself really i think i'm pretty sure i would regret when i'm looking back at my life as a grown, grown up or as a old nanny i will be surely regretting that i did never try it so mm -hmm. then my boyfriend looked at me and he was like yeah but then you need to jump it's very clear what you're saying is totally make makes total sense and there's never a right moment so of course I just want to know were you scared <laughs> yes yeah in a, in a bit yes and he Surely. helped you he helped you see that this was the moment he helped me really to say like that you are very clear already in your mind about like that you have to do it and then finding the moment that yeah was was not so clear for me but he made it clear for me that it's definitely not long anymore yeah nice yeah so that was a really good one and then the next day i went into the office again didn't tell anybody of course but it really resonated with me that i need it's time for me to go mm -hmm. and that it's a matter of days weeks month to kind of round up what i have here leave on good terms and yeah and then say goodbye. So I familiarized myself, first of all, with the thought, can I really let go? Is, how does it feel? How do I feel here? And and it felt good. I really, really saw it coming. It, feels, it felt really totally making sense and totally in the right direction. So I think a few months later, when I uh, I told my boss about it, he also saw it coming, I think. Uh, and I told him uh, before also. I was always, I think, looking back at my corporate life, I was always pushing about the boundaries of what you can do next to your job. I also did, I remember, Airbnb experiences that I offered. That was all approved by my HR officer. I always did um, yeah, a very transparent job. But... Um, 
I was hired and also for huge companies, for conferences in, in other countries, in Spain and in, in France. With those syrup making, it was, yeah, syrups from flowers, basically, and we had raw materials that I did. And that was already stretching the boundaries of my, my boss. He was yeah. like, oh, you're hired by those, by our competition or by the European Flavor Association um, for your private private side hustle basically yeah yeah so i was uh, he already knew that i'm not the typical i think uh corporate person that stays forever yeah. yeah have you ever heard the there's a book and a notion called don't quit your day job when you're kind of developing your skills on the side and you keep your corporate job and sometimes you never leave your corporate job but you keep it going and so it feels like you were doing that intuitively without knowing you were moving towards some invisible goal and then it just became apparent that that's what you've been building towards. Um, and so this is nice. when Louisa Jo was born. Indeed. So uh, it was a long, long beginning, basically, in the background. Um, but then I yeah, started my own company beginning last year, <clears throat> officially. And um, so the concept was there, the perfume was there. The, uh, I, what I also did is the whole testing on like allergy testing was done, which took a lot of time and resources so that I knew it's safe on skin um, because I knew as well, of course, when you, you sell it for one year even, um, it needs to be safe on skin. Otherwise, I'm responsible for allergies and everything. Yeah. So that was done in the background. It, yeah, you were doing it right. Indeed, I did it completely like following the corporate guidelines let's say oh yeah nice <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah i learned that of course that i don't want to um that i need to do it right indeed but uh, a very different angle and very not corporate let's say what i'm doing the whole concept so, so tell me about all, that yeah, tell me about <laughs> louisa joe it, this is a whole new venture and and also has a different paradigm from the corporate work you were doing so tell me introduce us to louisa joe yeah thank you yes first of all i i worked so long for those corporate um products for corporate perfumes and of course if you especially when you come from the testing also um job what i did is when when you reach when you want to have a perfume that is liked by thousands of people it gets more and more average of course you need to take off the sharp rounds you need to make it likable for everybody mm -hmm. and with my perfume i decided intuitively because it was done for my boyfriend only but i want to go the opposite i don't want to do a massa massa product i don't want to be liked by everybody i want to have those sharp sides to it let's say um and it yeah i don't want to please everybody but i would like to create something that a few people who do understand the concept they are totally into it and totally excited addicted and yeah that for them kind of because perfume what i noticed throughout the years when i was still giving it away for free i got a lot of feedback saying I get a lot of comments from other people asking what I'm wearing and then I don't want to reveal what it is because I don't want others to smell like I do. Mm. It's my trademark, you know, it's like you're, yeah, that people want to be recognized by a, a, smell, a certain smell, a perfume. And because it's such a skin scent enhancer and not just a floral fruity perfume that you can just buy and smells nice, it is very personal in a way. It really makes their trademark or their identity. So I really love that part of it that I noticed people don't want to share, which is on the one hand, of course, not good for my sales. It really <laughs> stops whenever I go to have a customer. It's not the um, the, the 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 progress or the the test. Yeah, it doesn't. The snowball system doesn't really help always. But it is a huge compliment, of course, for your product when your customer says, I don't want to tell anybody what I'm wearing. It's part of uh, my identity. 
it's indeed this is me I don't want anybody to smell like me Ah. and would you say that it's a different kind of person that kind of uh, wants that customization almost. So it, it, where, whereas before you were um, producing things for the masses, in this way, the type of person you're creating for is a completely different set of desires. Yeah, indeed. So the position was very high. I decided to, yeah, to have then the whole positioning very high end, very exclusive. And what you say, indeed, I was... The first year, last year, I I was very curious who will be my customer in the end. Is it really like because the price is so high, will it then be the people that buy yacht in Monaco? I went to the Monaco Yacht Show, for instance. But uh, interesting enough, when I look now at my customer portfolio, um, one thing they have in common is their mindset, that they appreciate craftsmanship, I guess, that they appreciate to have something specific that is very important to them, the sense of smell or the, the perfume that they wear. They, in general, they don't want to put products on their skin that they don't know about anything. They, everything they do, I think they do with a bit of a conscious choice. Yeah. But it can be, it's men, women, it's old, it's young, it's rich, but it's also not rich. So there is no commonality, except I think it's a mindset thing, much yeah. more. It's a value that you put on something that is important for you. Yeah. yeah. And it seems like with this, with what you're creating, actually, the person is the missing ingredient. So it comes together with your body. And so it's actually, you're the missing ingredient, you're the ingredient, you add yourself to this to this product and then it becomes what it is nice so yeah thank you it, it only materializes after you put it on <laughs> nice yeah. yeah yeah well well put <laughs> thank yeah. you and that's a really beautiful idea that um i think i identify with this and also it's an authenticity right where you're where you are actually just amplifying what you who you are instead of putting on a perfume you're amplifying your own unique scent and so and and with the pheromones that's that's an attraction thing tell us a little bit about that as well yeah um so we just want to know if we'll all be chased down like your boyfriend was on the streets of amsterdam yeah <laughs> indeed the or the flies are also coming <laughs> <laughs> behind you and mosquitoes no 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 um yeah pheromone so when you google pheromone perfumes there's a huge market out there that i was not aware of back then when i created this and i don't believe in this market i have to say mm. um to be honest, because um, what is out there on the market are pheromone perfumes. They don't even have a smell. They were tested also. It doesn't have an impact. Um, it doesn't work because uh, I'm pretty sure the reason is the pheromones that those commercial products use are synthetic pheromones, so created in the lab. Um, and I think they even disturb your natural pheromone production. Mm. Um, so it surely doesn't work. Um, but there is, of course, a huge market in a way that as we get older, our pheromone production decreases. So it could be a reason why people that are getting older also find it more difficult to find a partner, for instance. So people would like to buy a perfume. It would be easy if we can just spray on pheromones and then you increase your attractiveness again. So I do understand the market a bit. Uh, it just doesn't help what, what's out there. But uh, when I used to create the perfume for my boyfriend back then, I just came back from a very inspiring week in Italy with a perfume, natural perfume guru. It was the most expensive uh, holidays I've ever done, I think. Um, but it felt like I just turned 30 back then and I thought it's an investment in myself. I need to know about those the, the natural perfume guru, what he has to say about aromatherapy as well. And it was a, a great teaching. And he was into natural pheromones and the power of those. And I smelled them and I was totally intrigued myself. So for me, it was not about the what they 
particularly do to us, but more like I was directly hooked. It had an impact on me. So that's why I use them in the perfumes as well. You have to imagine a bit, I think, for the average person, it would smell terrible first sight when you sm first sniff. But it's a bit like when you're an expert in, I don't know, like, let's say, musician. When you're a musician, you also like a bit more the weird sounds because mm. all the, the nice thing, what's already out there, been there, done that, it's okay. Yep. But if you're a perfume expert, you also appreciate a bit the notes that are a bit wild and, let's say, dirty or a yep. bit a bit different and weird. So I think that was my my experience back then. So I used those. And then looking at the feedback that my boyfriend and the other people that was wearing my perfume, what they got, like, for instance, also, can I, I need to, I need to have that perfume, I, I would kill for it. I was like, I would kill for it. So I, for perfume, like, why would you do that? So strong things that I heard and brought back that I thought, Maybe there is something happening with the perfumes, with the pheromones. And I cannot put my fingers exactly on it. There's no research really about it, um, showing showing that it does work. But I'm pretty sure because it's natural what I use, um, other than what's on the market, uh, I do think that it could well be that there's something happening. Yeah, nice. And so with your your perfume house do you call it a perfume house or mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah what can we do we can buy your signature fragrance is that right anyone can tell tell us a little about uh, your offering at the moment because yeah. i'm i'm ready to i want to smell i want to be the missing ingredient already and I if others good. want to how how does that work what, do, what are you working on and what do you how can people get involved with this yeah good question so because i don't want to choose the direct and let's say most obvious that way to to sell and to get out there which then would be a yeah standard positioning again i don't want to go into retail hmm. so you don't find me at sephora or any of those shops um i much rather would like to keep a personal touch to it tell the stories to people uh, try it on the skin and a perfume is really yeah, it's an invisible product. So online, I find it very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, you need to try it on your skin to see if you are hooked. You need to see if it also, it's also not a product that I would say you spontaneously buy. Mm -hmm. um, I think what works most is if I put it on somebody's skin and the day after, you know, then they call me and say like, oh, it really... It was, I, f I felt lingered the entire day. And so that's my approach. Uh, I meet some people can reach me through my website. They can send me a message saying that they are interested to meet up. I always have uh, meet up days in Amsterdam that I do, but I can also meet up somewhere else. And then I show to them my three perfumes. Um, the, the, there are three perfumes. So I initially created one for my ex-boyfriend, mm -hmm. but I saw from there... Like I told you, my first customer, for instance, I went to his office uh, and there were 10 colleagues with him. And we all unpacked together kind of my uh, my perfume and three colleagues already said like, oh, I also want to have that. And his eyes were like, oh, oh no, no, this is for me only. I want to have it for me. <laughs> so I went back into my atelier creating two more perfumes that are having the same signature. I wanted to stay to to what I built or what I created and then I have two twists one a bit more feminine with a lipstick accord um, and one more masculine which can also really work fabulous well fabulous on a feminine skin but at wild tobacco so it has the tobacco leaves on there dried tobacco leaves so those three perfumes indeed um, we can meet up um, for coffee, perfume coffee, and then I can show you those three perfumes. You can try them on. You don't have to uh, yeah, buy them directly, but really try them, and then people get back to me. What I also offer is for companies, that's a different thing, uh, bespoke perfumes, so tailor-made perfumes, um, because I also see that uh, companies 
um, would like to have this identity, scented, branded identity with smell, because there's a lot of research that shows that, I don't know, retail works much better when you have a nice scent in the room, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I did, for instance, projects for beauty care um, companies that wanted to have a specific smell that is not off the shelf from the huge companies, but with more specific fragrances that they had in mind. It's like a logo. Uh, it's like a logo, <clears throat> only a scent. That's beautiful. Indeed. Yeah. 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 We need a, now we need a House of Peregrine scent. There's just yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I really, what I hear you saying and what I hear you bringing attention to is there's more dimensions to our identity. We, we tend to focus on our visual identity or our design, um, but, but what you've taught me today is that smell really is an, an immense part of our cultural experience, our identity, but also um, how we are in the world. Um, and so if you're someone like me who doesn't really like to put things on, like it makes me feel um, like I'm like I don't wear brands, I don't wear things like this, but I really love that authentic, authentic notion of bringing myself to something. Um, I feel like that's this is a really like beautiful notion. Um, and so I, I thank you so much for um, joining us today. Um, and um, I appreciate you taking the time of explaining this to us. Um, and I look forward to, yeah, I, I, I have a feeling we'll be meeting for a perfume coffee in Amsterdam. Um, yes, soon. thank you. How can people reach you if they want to? Um, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Yes, so I guess uh, through my website would be the first uh, first step to take. There's um, a contact form. But also I'm active on LinkedIn under my name, Francisca Jostheit. Um, and also a bit active on Instagram, Luisa Joe, Wild Perfumery. Okay. I guess... You will put your, the the I'll put everything below. Yep. Indeed, yep. that's great. But yeah, indeed, what you just said as well. In people should not forget if you are working in a corporate uh, environment or if you are an entrepreneur, you are a personal brand always. And as a personal brand, you you showcase yourself each time. You pitch yourself each time when you meet somebody. Yep. And it's not just about the first impression to to get somewhere but to stick to somebody's mind and perfume is a perfect tool to stick to somebody's mind because perfume is directly linked to our limbic system where all the emotions are so if you can stick to somebody's mind through perfume that that's very beautiful and very powerful yeah yeah thank you so much i've had so much fun talking to you thank um, you. and i hope everyone will reach out and uh consider this part of their personal brand thank you Um, i'm sure we'll see you again but thanks for joining us today on the house of peregrine podcast Um, have an incredible rest of your day thank you so much for asking me (laughs)